Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Regenerative Medicine interview series. This is the series Portraits of Hope. Portraits of Hope are interviews of individuals who are part of the broad patient advocacy community that one day will see benefits from regenerative medicine and stem cell research. And one of my very favorite people is Katie Jackson. Katie Jackson uh, is the leader of Help for HD International. Is that right, Katie? Yes. So Katie and I met in the journey first in 2009 at the World Stem Cell Summit event that I uh, co-chaired uh, in Pasadena, California. And it was a really singular moment in my journey as a patient advocate because during the break between the, at, right after the opening session, Katie was there with family members and also um, with uh, another family that have been impacted by Huntington's disease. As a lay person, an educated lay person, and my, a policy person in law, I was unfamiliar with Huntington's disease. And as I heard that story, in about 15 minutes, um, not only was it a riveting story, but it shook me to the core. And it made me believe that the direction of the Regenerative Medicine Foundation and moving forward with the World Stem Cell Summit and advocacy uh, had importance and how critically important it was to move the needle on this research to try to bring it to populations. So Katie, welcome and I'm gonna ask you to tell me a little bit about yourself and your family's journey with Huntington's disease. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on, uh, Bernie. Whenever I get a chance to talk about Huntington's disease or juvenile Huntington's disease, I jump on it. So thank you so much for having me today. My journey started, um, I met my husband when I was very young, six years old, and we were really good friends and we played together and uh, we went to college and we took it uh, to a other relationship of, of starting to date. Um, and we found out uh, that he had Huntington's disease. And we found that out because his father, who he was estranged from, died from something called Huntington's disease. We knew nothing about it at the time. Um, I looked up Huntington's disease and I was completely shocked at what I read. My brother has cystic fibrosis. So I came from a family that we were born into advocacy. We, we did walks, we did stuff for my brother. But this disease, shocked me to the core. Uh, I, I learned that not only my husband had a 50% chance of inheriting Huntington's disease, but my children had a 50% chance now of inheritance if my husband, in fact, tested positive. He decided to get tested right away, right when he heard about his father's passing. And um, unfortunately, he did test positive for Huntington's disease. Um, my husband lived a 14-year, incredibly long journey with HD, and he passed away um, on August 25th um, of last year after battling so hard um, for so long, but he made a huge impact on this world. So I'm very proud of him and his journey and how he lived um, with such a horrific disease so positively um, and, and till the end fought for new therapies and treatments and the cure for our children who now of course are at 50% have a 50% chance of inheriting their father's same fate. What are the challenges of the illness? There are so many, you know, um, it's, it's, it's often referred to as the worst disease known to mankind. There's cognitive impairment, there's psychiatric behaviors, there's of course the uh, chorea, the involuntary movement, you have dystonia, and sometimes you have um, psychosis, delusions, um, these people really, they lose every single part of them. This disease takes everything away from them. And the families grieve for so long. Um, you know, Huntington's, you start grieving Huntington's on the day of diagnosis. So families have to endure years and years of grief and every loss, the loss of being able to walk, the loss of being able to talk. Some have to get on feeding tubes, the aspiration, the choking, the swallowing, um, what these people have to endure, the weight loss. My husband was 6'1", and he weighed less than 90 pounds when he passed away. He couldn't even swallow his food without choking. He was scared 
because obviously choking is scary. Um, his movement, he had bruises, he, he had injuries, trying to keep those injuries under control, like the, you know, from just the worn skin. He was skin on bone and he was constantly moving. His skin was wearing down. Um, he couldn't even put food in his mouth because of his involuntary movements. It was, it was a terrible, terrible uh, way to go. And um, it was a long, long journey. Huntington's disease is, is very long. Katie, I had the honor of meeting Michael uh, at the, uh, the World Stem Cell Summit, and I was very impressed with him at that time. Thank and you, you. You, you were a lovely couple and meant to be together. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about the challenges of families that have children that are facing juvenile Huntington's disease. So I, I learned about juvenile Huntington's disease pretty early on. I Googled it, and I was, I was very... Um, shocked at what I, what I learned. Um, the children, you know, you think of a disease that's often referred to as the worst disease known to mankind. And then you think about a child and these children, and my husband had a CAG, the repeat CAG of a 49, which is very high. And because of expansion and it coming off the father, my children are at higher risk of developing juvenile Huntington's disease. So of course, when I started reading and learning more about juvenile Huntington's disease, this became a, a big part of my, um, of my focus, having three children at risk. And the children deal with something a little bit more, they deal with a lot more than the adults do. In my mind, they have grand mal seizures. They have, the adults don't have seizures as often as the children. They have these horrible seizure, seizures. They deal with severe pain. Um, they have itching, their whole bodies itch, and they can't explain why, but these little kiddos, they itch until they bleed. Their whole bodies itch. They have sleep disturbance. I mean, the sleep disturbance, I had insomnia last night. I rarely do. Today, I feel crazy, right? I, I slept maybe two hours. These kids go days without sleeping. I've seen videos of these kiddos laying in bed and coming up and down from the bed just so frustrated because they haven't slept in days. Um, they get these, uh, these muscle seizures like I've never seen before. Um, I saw a film, my first film of seeing this, I was just heartbroken. Their bodies will stiffen up and their muscles will start to osculate and they start shaking and you could see the pain in their faces. Their necks squeeze up in pain. They start screaming in pain as their whole body is convulsing and these these seizures these these muscle seizures and it's so sad to watch these little babies endure this amount of pain they stay up all night crying of course you know before diagnosis they have such a hard time even getting diagnosed because no one wants to diagnose a child with jhd so the hoops these families have to go to just to get them diagnosed are huge hoops sometimes years and years of them not being able to keep up with school. You know, they, even in IEP and all these goals, they have to meet endpoints. These children cannot meet endpoints. They are losing their ability to learn and they are unlearning. Um, so the struggles are so, so hard. And these mothers and these fathers that advocate for these children, I mean, they're so strong, but I can't imagine being completely hopeless and helpless and watching your child go through juvenile Huntington's disease. And at the, in the end, they will die. They will die. So you have um, created a foundation, a nonprofit organization to assist families with Huntington's disease. And, and I wanna talk about that and then afterwards we can talk a little bit about the research that's going on. But tell me about Help for HD, your organization. Yeah. Yeah, so Help for HD International was started back in 2010, and it was started by a mother that her son had Huntington's disease, and she saw kind of a gap that needed to be filled. And um, she started it with a radio show. This was a simple radio show, a podcast that went live from her, her kitchen table um, that now has over 106,000 all-time listenership. Um, it's really become this really great program that we're able to shoot out information fast through still to this day. Um, a couple of years ago, I uh, took leadership and CEO. I was vice president for many years before that. And um, it's really cool. It's a grassroots organization where all families live in, uh, living or impacted by HD. 
or JHD. Um, it's really that old uh, nonprofit model that we sit around our houses and we talk about how we can help our community and our families. We've come up with great programs as far as um, relief programs. We've stepped in and helped families with electrical bills and food. These are quality of life things that we take for granted, a lot of us, just to be able to eat. People with HD, they take in thousands and thousands of calories to keep their, to keep their um, weight on them. Who can afford that, that bill, right, of the food bill alone? So we've been able to come in and we've been able to help families with some medical stuff, medical equipment. Um, we've even helped families with rent to keep their homes and keep the roofs over the head. We've evacuated families out of Florida during hurricane season to help get their loved ones out. We've helped during Hurricane Harvey. We went into the shelters and brought toothbrushes and food and, and things to help people with those things to get them through these natural disasters. We helped Puerto Rico um, during the hurricanes. So we've done a lot of work um, on that kind of stuff. We also have law enforcement education. People with Huntington's disease look like they are intoxicated or you know, uh, they are very much targeted by law enforcement. So we started a law enforcement education program and an EMT education program, which has been awesome to be able to help educate those departments. We've traveled all over the United States teaching law enforcement and first responders about Huntington's disease. Uh, we of course have our radio show. We launched our TV show. We do um, education days all year, interactive education days. And we do an annual symposium in October every year. Um, so there's a lot going on. We do a lot. <laughs> I'm tired just listening to all the things that you do. Yeah. Um, I, at the time of this recording, of course, we have the California fires and it's the time of uh, the pandemic. Are you finding uh, even more challenges with the community in these days? Yes, absolutely. Definitely with the pandemic, you know, the fires are, are, we're currently, I live in California, we're currently, it looks like, it looks awful outside, you can't even look outside your window, but we haven't got that far yet into the fires because we're still kind of active in that. The pandemic, we came on right away and we started a relief fund. Um, it was a COVID-19 fund. Um, thank, we are so thankful to uh, Genentech and um, Griffin Foundation for stepping in and helping us help families uh, during the pandemic. So remind me what the uh, URL, your website is for people that want to reach you or to watch some of the great programming that your foundation has. Sure, our website is www.help4hd.org. Uh, now I want to move to a, another topic that's near and dear to the Regenerative Medicine Foundation. And that's the uh, research that's being uh, done right now to find, understand the root causes of the disease and potential treatments. And I know you're a good friend of a friend of our organization, Dr. Jan Nolta at UC Davis. So if you can tell me about your, the journey that you've had in dealing with researchers and what your hopes are for the future in finding treatments or even a cure one day. Yeah, so I'm never gonna forget when I first met uh, Dr. Nolta. I was at a Huntington's event at UC Davis and we had this new researcher that just came to California. She wasn't new in research. She had been doing research for years, but new, new to, to our community. And um, I got to hear her speak and I was blown away, obviously. Jan Nolta is a world-class stem cell researcher. I mean, she's amazing. And um, back in 2015, I started really looking into JHD and really learning and talking to families and, um, there was no JHD research, none. People, when there's an adult version of a disease, they typically look at the adults first, but then what about the children? So there was really no, there was some observational studies, but there was no research going on in JHD. And I was terrified for my own children and, and terrified for the community in general, not having research. So one night it was, I, it was 10 o'clock at night, I'm gonna be honest. And Jan accidentally gave me um, her phone number. <laughs> <laughs> and I called her, I, I texted her and I said, can I talk to you? And, and we talked and, and I told her how I was terrified about JHD and, and we needed research and stem cell was the way to go. And, and I would do anything I could to support her. If we had to do fundraising, whatever we needed to do, we would support her. And she said like the words that I will never forget is Katie, we're already, we're already looking into it. We're already working on it. 
And I was just right then knowing Dr. Jan Nolta's looking at stem cell research for JHD is like fireworks, right? Like, thank goodness. So in 2015, we held the very first ever juvenile Huntington's disease walk ever. And we raised money and all the money went to the lab to support Jan Nelta um, and Dr. Kyle Fink's amazing JHD work that they're doing over there. We still support the lab to this day. It's not much. This is a lot of money. This is one thing I've realized about research. It is so much money and we can't even touch it as a disease community to, but what we can do is do the little fundraising that we do do to help her to show we are so thankful for them. We are so thankful for what they are doing. The moms are so thankful. And the great thing about Jan and Kyle is they're very open to us. If we ask them to speak, they invited moms. We held the JHD walk. They invited the moms and the children living with JHD into the lab to be able to get, to be able to feel the hope of where it is, to see all these lab benches lined up and to see a sign that said juvenile Huntington's disease. How cool is that for a mom that has no hope to see that there is hope? People are looking at this disease and it was Dr. Jan Nolta. So we raised money. Um, I think at that time we raised $21,000. That's really big for Huntington's disease and juvenile Huntington's disease. And we were able to write her a check um, to show her that we are there for her for anything. And we have been there. If we find out that there's any like government meeting, um, we, I, we spoke at CERM. Um, whenever we need to stand up to stand beside Jan and her research, we do because we know how important this mesenchymal stem cell research is to our children and our community. Um, so that's kind of uh, the start in 2015 of a, of a long journey working beside the amazing Dr. Jan Nolte. Tell me a little bit about the research and you asked the question, how cool is that? Hey, it's very cool. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about the research. Yeah. So I remember like I was just, I, I have obviously no science background and I do humanitarian work and, and I found out this, I, I can say mesenchymal stem cells. So that right there, I, I, I was Already really people think you're really smart if you can say that. <laughs> yes. Trust me. Go ahead. Yes. So it started with um, Dr. Nolta coming into our community and explaining to us about these paramedic cells, these MSCs. And um, what, hap what happened was Jan started working, and now don't quote me on this because this is coming from you know, a family member, but the MSCs, they were working on the striatal loss um, and these MSCs going in for the neurons the, using the BDNF or these um, brain neurofactor things that they do, this amazing stuff they do. Well, it worked in mice, right? But they would have to do multiple brain injections. Well, that's not feasible, right? So they went back to the lab, and now the amazing Dr. Kyle Fink is working on these new molecules that will actually turn off the mutant Huntington. So still using the mesenchymal stem cells and that platform that they used in the beginning, but also adding on this like second molecule that will help turn off the, uh, the protein, the mutated mutant protein. So exciting stuff. It's still in the mouse models, right? So Jan Nolta takes care of these amazing JHD mice. And Dr. Kyle Fink and his team worked on these amazing molecules. Um, we just need to get it into humans. I can't wait till it goes from the animal model and we could actually do a human trial. Um, as everyone knows, this is a very, that's watching this knows that's, that's a very long process um, to get there. But I have hope that we'll get there. And especially with Dr. Jan Nolte and Kyle Fink um, and their, their drive to stand by our sides and fight by us. I think together uh, we may be small, but we're we're pretty mighty. So, Katie, I want to thank you. The Regenerative Medicine Foundation for 18 years has been handing out um, stem cell action or stem cell action regenerative medicine awards yeah. to advocates in the community. And in 2014 in San San Antonio, we recognized the grassroots HD community. Uh, your foundation, among others, are a true inspiration uh, to all of us and are so important. So I want to thank you for joining us and allowing us to interview. And I assure you, many, many people who are not aware of Huntington's disease or juvenile Huntington's disease are now going to be aware of thank what's you. going on. You are a true portrait of hope. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Bernie.